Hi, everyone around the world. Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for downloading this episode of the China History Podcast. We're available for you 24-7 from the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. And thanks to listener email in Stockholm, Sweden, the broken links to CHP episodes 7 and 23 are now fixed. So if you want to hear the episodes on Wu Zetian and the Northern and Southern Dynasties, you could check them out. My apologies to anyone who was inconvenienced by that. I have to get my email address up on the new website. Y'all can contact me anytime at laszlo at chinahistorypodcast.com. Something was wrong with my iTunes store feed, but I'm happy to say after a nudge to the iTunes people to look into this unnatural phenomenon, it spontaneously started working again Monday morning, the 28th. Not all the shows are available in the iTunes store. If you want all 65 plus this one, you'll have to go to the website at chinahistorypodcast.com and you could download till your heart's content. We're into our fourth installment of this Deng Xiaoping overview. Today we're picking up in the tumultuous year of 1966. The year Revolver came out. 1966. This is when the Cultural Revolution starts. And we'll see all these great ideas Deng Xiaoping had and utterances he made, earlier decisions made under fire. One by one, they all came back to haunt him. I mentioned in part one, after the failure to establish a Soviet in Guangxi, 1931, Deng hightailed it back to Shanghai, and this too, sure enough, this past incident was dredged up, and Deng had to answer for that again. He had to answer to everything. Doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, he had to answer for that too. So, 1966-67, Deng was uh, raked over the coals. So, let's set this up. Great Leap Forward, no words to describe the totality of it and the extent of the mass suffering. Suffice to say, when it was all over and the famines were in full bloom throughout the land, Deng, Liu, and the party center had to perform triage on the nation. That's what 1959, 60, 61 were all about. No one was talking too much about economic expansion and whatnot. These were three bad years, and China was just fighting to break even. In these kinds of situations, sometimes you can't keep referring to the operations manual. In order to stabilize the patient, Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, and all their people had to prescribe a whole bunch of medications that had been locked away for over a decade. They started sprinkling incentives all over the place in order to motivate people and appeal to their natural Chinese good common sense and aspirations. And guess what? Things began to stabilize and gel, and the countryside started to bounce back little by little. And that's how Deng got himself in trouble. All these guys, anyone who took their eye off the revolutionary ball and focused on practical matters instead, ended up getting mangled later on. After the Great Leap Forward, Mao took a step back, and everyone thought he would just sort of, you know, quietly act like a chairman emeritus. You know, they'd all to the last man keep bowing down to Mao, you know, pay him his due for his great achievements up to this time. The Great Leap, everyone knew since Peng De Huai dared to speak up at uh, Lu Shan, at the Lu Shan Hui Yi. You know, the best thing to do, the smart thing to do about the Great Leap was keep your mouth shut, your head down, look the other way, don't make a big deal about it. So if you can imagine for a second, Mao Zedong in the 1960s, even after the Great Leap Forward, he knows he's definitely going to be written into the pages of Chinese history. He's a modern-day Qin Shi Huang, who he uh, admired very much, not surprisingly. He's like Liu Bang. Sima Yan, Li Shermin, Zhu Yuanzhang. Like all these guys, he brought order out of chaos in China. He was a founding father of a new Chinese nation and ruled the country with an iron fist and, you know, kept that whole thing together, sometimes with only the force of his will. And his country's people, you know, the Zhongguo Lao Baixing, they worshipped him, and this adoration was Mao's elixir of life. This is what he lived for. Back in 1960, although some foreign nations could point some fingers at China and say, you know, whatever disparaging things that people of all nations say about each other, you know, to puff themselves up a little and you know, where they come from, no one was disrespecting China. There were no Treaty of Shimonosekis, Treaty of Nanjing, extraterritoriality, foreign legations, and all these reminders of the 
late Qing period, in the early Republic. So although Mao's brand had the taint of the Great Leap on it, he was still, without peer, the main man in China who had truly lifted China up and, you know, began to erase these past humiliations. You know, no one could take that achievement away from Mao. But Mao, he had certain well-known character flaws. As far as this episode on Deng Xiaoping is concerned, the one thing about Mao that really rubbed him the wrong way was when he said something and no one paid enough attention. To a guy like Mao, to have done all he had done, to so clearly be, you know, the emperor, and not get his due, this really affected him. He didn't like this at all. And that's what the Cultural Revolution was all about. It was a lesson he was teaching his oldest and closest comrades. It was a lesson that showed who was the boss and what happens when you disrespect the boss and don't make him happy. Like I said last time, Mao, the philosopher, the creator of Mao Zedong thought, the guiding principle for the Communist Party, he was still doing his thing and pushing the same old ideas. But he saw in the early 60s and into 63, 64, 1965, it seemed no one in power cared enough or demonstrated the passion the, the Yenan spirit that Mao still had for struggle, for revolution, and for, in general, not sitting still, to keep on keeping on and stirring things up, supporting the mass line. And these guys like Deng, who, you know, no one could deny or say anything about their loyalty to the party and their love of the country. They were untouchable in this respect. But Deng and his ilk, and Liu Shaoqi was certainly one, they were pragmatists and willing to bend the rules in order to get everything sorted out first. This wasn't done in a malicious way. Deng's loyalty to Mao could never be questioned, ever. Mao Zedong had been the top guy more or less since the Zunyi Conference in mid-January 1935. Over three decades, Mao had been the elder brother to all these guys. And now, after he goofs... You know, with the Great Leap, fingers are pointed and a lot of inferences made, and no one's willing to, you know, share the blame with him. And little by little, brave voices, including Liu Shaoqi, put the blame for the Great Leap squarely on Mao, and no one would admit they went along for the ride. Now, had anyone spoken up, it would have been like committing political suicide. So they were damned if they spoke up, damned now that they didn't. Mao felt marginalized, and he was determined to make a comeback, and in this comeback lay the Cultural Revolution. Here's how it all started. Early June 1966, Deng's world was completely turned upside down. There had been endless signals that this day was possibly coming, and now here it was. It was like going over the edge of a waterfall when Mao focused his massive energy on you. There was nothing Deng could do, and he was completely at Mao's mercy. Things started to get out of hand real fast, and the whole matter of students rebelling against authority and everyone rising up, Liu and Deng saw they had a tiger by the tail here, and the only one who had the prestige and authority and connections to Lin Biao, who ran the military, was of course Mao. He was the guy. Mao these days was holed up on the 18th floor of a swanky Shanghai hotel, Cathay Mansions. Like John and Yoko in the Amsterdam Hilton, Mao and Jiang Qing base themselves there and, you know, of course, also in Hangzhou and, you know, wherever Mao was, that's where the party center was. So Liu and Deng came running down to Shanghai and they said, you know, hey, you know, we could use your help. We have this situation in Beijing and everything's getting serious with the savagery of these protests. Then Mao exacted his revenge and he tells them, hey, you guys can handle this. What do you need me for? Gee, nobody needed me all these years. Now you have some college protesters and you ask me to get involved? You know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. So Deng and Liu go back to Beijing empty-handed, and they have to face this realization that Mao is letting them dangle. Mao makes his big comeback by doing, what else? Taking a swim across the Yangtze at the Wuhan Bridge, July 16th, 1966. He's back. And amidst all the chaos in the schools, he headed back to Beijing, and Deng and Liu both get the cold shoulder. And in no uncertain terms, Ma let them know that so far he didn't approve of the way they had handled things with the protests while he was gone. And before they knew it, they were in front of an angry public, jammed into the Great Hall of the People, right there off Tiananmen Square. Deng, along with Liu, and even Zhou Enlai, all of them had to publicly criticize themselves, their shortcomings and their wrong decisions and thinking, and everything sort of 
exploded from this point on. This is when the Red Guards ran amok and did their destructive thing. At a massive rally on August 1st, Mao gave his support for their actions by symbolically wearing the iconic Red Guard armband. The violence, terror, anarchy, racial chauvinism, everything, the summer of 1966. It was in full gear. Nothing like this had ever happened before. The Red Guards, at least for the time being, seemed to have a blank check in their hands from the bank of Mao Zedong, and they pretty much did whatever they wanted. One after another, there were these massive Red Guard rallies. Millions, mostly young people, participated in the hoopla and took part in you know, smashing old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits. By January 1967, the radicals had taken over. No one was in charge. By July 67, it's looking like China's almost at the tipping point between anarchy and some semblance of order. By this time, the various factions of Red Guards began attacking each other, and someone, certainly Zhou Enlai, maybe others, talked some sense into Mao, and the chairman called in Lin Biao and told him to put the kibosh on all the rioting and tone things down with the Red Guards. By this time, Deng Xiaoping and his wife, Zhuo Lin, had been placed under house arrest. They were still living within the Zhongnanhai leadership compound. Mao, despite allowing the Deng family to suffer terrible humiliations and indignities, was still protecting him and shielding him from the worst of the Red Guard attacks. The five children of Deng Xiaoping and Zhuo Lin were sent away and suffered through a myriad of abuse from their classmates and, in short, everyone in general. Deng's oldest son, Pu Feng, was harassed so badly by Red Guards, he ended up jumping out of a window or perhaps was thrown out of the window, broke his back, and remains a paraplegic to this day. Currently, Deng Pu Feng is a vice chairman of the CPPCC and retired uh, as chairman of the China Disabled Persons Federation in 2008. So Deng laid as low as he could. Mao had branded him the, quote, number two person in authority pursuing the capitalist road. We all know who number one was. For two years, he had no contact with his children. 1968 rolled around, and finally, there's some movement on Deng's case. An official investigation was called for to investigate the crimes of Deng Xiaoping. And this is where Deng really gets it. He had to write endless self-criticisms and continue to endure the unendurable. You remember in 1956, we hit the Ba the Eighth Party Congress, now it's 13 years later, April 69, we have the Jiu Da, the Ninth Party Congress. The famous Jiu Da, this is the party congress that formally ended the careers of Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Or did it? Well, Liu, he'd be dead in seven months, and he'd been under house arrest and suffering the worst possible degradations. But Deng, well, Jiang Qing wanted him expelled from the party, but Mao, he had other ideas. He went along with the radicals who were now officially ensconced in power, and back them in relieving Dong of all powers. But kicking him out of the CCP, Mao wasn't ready to do that yet. A man of Deng Xiaoping's talents were too hard to find, and besides, Mao knew in his heart Dung's loyalty was still there. So, while Mao played God and Dung played Job, things went from bad to worse in China. 1969, this was the year the Soviets and the Chinese are mauling each other along the Usuri River in the frozen northeast. The Sino-Soviet relationship was so frosty that Mao came up with the idea to dispatch the key leaders to various parts of the countryside. And just in case of a Soviet invasion, the key leaders would already be strategically placed throughout the country to organize resistance. So off they went. Zhu De got sent to Guangdong, Ye Jianying to Hunan. Nie Rongzhen and Chen Yi to Henan, Chen Yun, Wang Zhen, and Deng Xiaoping got sent to the revolutionary province of Jiangxi. In Ezra Vogel's book, he mentions this was all Lin Biao's idea because the paranoid heir apparent to Mao wanted to make sure all these potential rivals were as far away from access to Mao as possible. Whether this is true, who knows, but auspiciously, right after Lin Biao went down in flames over the vast expanse of eastern Mongolia, in September 1971, these leaders were all allowed to go back to Beijing. But those years, it's said, from 1969 to 1971, when Deng lived, worked, and studied in Jiangxi, 
He had a lot of time on his hands to think about China's future. A lot of the plans that he later implemented in the 70s and 80s were formulated during this period of solitude and reflection. By now, he had criticized himself ad nauseum and had shown enough contrition whereby he didn't face the kinds of attacks he did in 1966 and 67. So Deng and Zhuo Lin went off to live in Jiangxi. You know, they went to Nanchang where good old Zhou Enlai had prepared in advance for their living and working arrangements. The family was reunited little by little. Deng Pufang arrived last in June of 1971. How did he spend his days? Deng arose at 6.30 a.m., got ready, studied Mao's works for an hour. He had breakfast and then off to work, Deng and Zhuo Lin went. Now, Deng may have been a capitalist roader and all, but he was still a major celebrity in China, so he was sort of escorted to his place of work using a special route, and he performed manual labor at the factory, which is nothing new for Deng Xiaoping, having worked in France and all, and done all those uh, menial jobs maybe half a century earlier. At the factory, he was simply known as Lao Deng, Old Deng. He and Zhuo Lin, you know, tended their own vegetable garden, raised chickens, Deng washed floors, cut firewood, and lived an altogether humble lifestyle. After Deng Pufang returned home, Deng was very hands-on in helping with the daily care of his now disabled son. Deng's stepmother lived with the Deng family and prepared the food and oversaw the upkeep of their house. For Deng, although this was a humble existence and not exactly what he was cut out for, it kept him far from the madding crowd in Beijing and Shanghai. It was a very quiet time filled with reflection and planning for the days that lie ahead. Dung had to have thought by now that if he could just tough it out, surely Mao would bring him back from the wilderness. In the meantime, he lived this routine, and according to his daughter, Dung Rong would lose himself in thought. And they had this garden path around the house, and he'd just walk around the house, you know, as much as 40 times, you know, along this garden path, and would reflect on the future. And, you know, he did this month after month for years. Well, while Dung was... Languishing down in Jiangxi, Nixon had come and gone, and the whole opening up to the West was now in motion. Deng had lots of time on his hands to think about the whole notion of opening up to the West and how Western technology and certain economic systems could be used to bring China back from the brink. And he saw what was going on in Japan. Japan had totally bounced back spectacularly from the devastation of World War II. Their economic growth in the 50s and 60s was amazing. How is China now going to duplicate such success? How is China going to get close enough to the U.S. to gain all the benefits that Japan had received from their economic partnership? Now, we're going to cover the whole Lin Biao incident in a future podcast, but in September 1971, he fled China with his family after an alleged plot to assassinate Mao and seize power in a coup d'etat you know, after it was discovered. His plane crashed and burned, and with that, Deng lost one big rival. Lin Biao had been China's defense minister since Peng Dehuai spoke up and got canned in 1959. He was Mao's anointed successor, and after this incident, to say it was a game changer is putting it mildly. August 1973, we have the Shirda, the 10th Party Congress. Called earlier than scheduled because of the urgency and also because, well, frankly, by this time, Mao was clearly on his last legs. He still had three more years to go yet, but as we'll maybe look at one day, Mao's last three years were touch and go at best. If you remember from one of the earlier episodes when we discussed Nixon's visit to China, the day Nixon went to go visit Mao and enters Mao's study, which also served as his bedroom. It was filled with medical apparatus that had been hastily put aside and shielded from view. Mao had to put things right. In March 1972, the first of the rehabilitations started happening. By the end of 1972, Zhou Enlai had begun to pave the way for Deng's return. In February 1973, Deng's chance came when, after a long and contrite letter from Deng to Mao, the chairman gave the okay. August 14th, 1972, in a letter, Mao called for Deng's return. Before leaving Jiangxi, Deng makes a visit to Beijing in the Soviet base area that was one of Mao's several crowning achievements and a place where Deng had made history. 
On February 20th, 1973, Deng and his family boarded a train, and this second Jiangxi period in his life came to an end. He was Beijing-bound and ready to pick up where he left off. He had made his peace with Chairman Mao in a letter. Mao appealed to his better sense and did the right thing by bringing Deng Xiaoping back to where he once belonged. Two days later, Deng arrives in Beijing. Now, Mao had just gone to a lot of trouble and ruined a lot of lives to prove a point to Deng. So even Mao, in his very degenerated state, knew he had to handle this one carefully. Deng slowly, slowly tiptoed back into power. Zhou Enlai now is afflicted with bladder cancer and has only a couple more years to live. But he engineers Deng's return in a series of Politburo meetings. The Gang of Four has by this time become a force to reckon with, but when they put up resistance about giving Deng any responsibility and allowing him to participate in any party meetings at the highest level, Mao overrules them. March 9, 1973, it's official. Mao signs a document which basically says, Deng is back, and with that, the info is disseminated all the way down to the capillaries of the party apparatus, and with that, Deng makes a comeback. March 29, 1973, Deng meets Mao for the first time in six years. In this meeting, Mao makes his peace with Deng and tells him, work hard and stay healthy. He then makes Deng a vice premier, and Zhou has Deng begin his comeback by dealing with foreign affairs. Now, he was a vice premier, but Deng was still not back inside the Politburo yet. However, even though not a Politburo member, he still sat in on the important meetings. He accompanied Zhou on many of the ceremonial jobs involving foreign dignitaries. Deng Xiaoping was clearly being groomed to take over from the great man, who probably knew his long and full life was nearing its end. April 12, 1973, Deng makes his first official appearance, and with that, all the China watchers all over the world could see the big guy and the little package was back. Deng met with Prince Norodom Sihanouk. This was a pretty big deal. Not meeting with Sihanouk, just being in the public eye and all. I mean, the last time Deng was in the foreign spotlight was 1968. He'd been out of the public spotlight for over half a decade, and now suddenly, here he is, with no fanfare or announcement. August 1973, we have the Tenth Party Congress, the Gang of Four are at the height of their power, so Deng and many of the other leaders, disgraced during the Cultural Revolution, are back and slowly working their way back into power. Deng is gradually climbing onto the topmost rungs of the party, but he has Jiang Qing, Zhang Chunqiao, Wang Hongwen, Yao Wenyuan, and Kang Sheng constantly pushing back against him, anything he tries to do. Mao made 38-year-old Wang Hongwen first vice chairman, which put him third in party ranking behind Mao and Zhou. He was looking to be Mao's successor. He was no fan of Deng Xiaoping. Mao, by this time, was as sick as a dog. All those years of smoking and, well, in general, not taking care of himself finally caught up with Mao. On top of all this, he was suffering from ALS and not very presentable. He spoke to all the top leaders via go-betweens. No one got to see Mao anymore. Mao became increasingly unhappy with his number two guy for over 40 years. He was angry about how Zhou Enlai was managing the new Sino-U.S. relationship. And after Brezhnev visited the U.S. and signed a peace treaty, he thought China was being used by the U.S. and that Zhou had allowed this to happen. Jiang Qing, ever the opportunist and sensitive to her husband's moods, read the dissatisfaction in Mao and herself, never having been a big fan of Zhou Enlai, Jiang Qing moved on him and launched a political attack on Zhou for failing and looking out for China's best interests in managing the new Sino-U.S. relationship. This put Zhou in a lot of hot water, and in his poor and deteriorating health was forced to endure a boatload of criticism, CCP style, in no less a setting than the Great Hall of the People. The whole upshot of all this was Zhou got shoved aside, and Mao put Deng Xiaoping in charge with the captainship of this new relationship. Mao liked how Deng had managed the Soviets back in the 50s and 60s and how he never backed down and wasn't afraid to criticize them. 
When the time came for Deng to offer up his criticism of his lifelong mentor, he did it. And Mao heard this, and he said it was good. As a reward for his loyalty, Deng was made a member of the Central Military Commission. Mao saw to this personally. Slowly, Deng began replacing Zhou Enlai at meetings where the premier would normally have attended. As for Deng's role in the CMC, it was a shocker to end all shockers when Lin Biao made his attempt on Mao's life. Some serious stuff was going on in the military, and any and all Lin Biao loyalists were being rooted out. Mao put Ye Jianying and Deng in charge of reforming the military structure after so many years of neglect and downright abuse. On April 10, 1974, Deng represents China at the United Nations and makes his historic speech in front of the General Assembly. It's a great moment for China on the world stage and obviously boosted Deng's prestige. Jiang Qing had thoroughly fought against selecting Deng for this job. Mao told her to back down and the decision was his. While in New York City, Deng visited Wall Street. And as Vogel mentioned that, not having much money and all, Deng arranged for some cheap 39-cent toys for his grandchildren to be purchased from the now-defunct Woolworths. Deng flew back to China by way of Paris. It was his first time back since he left in 1926. He bought 200 croissants and several pounds of cheese and divvied up these delicacies with Zhou Enlai and Zhou's wife, Deng Ying Chao, as well as other fellow comrades who spent time in Paris with him in the 1920s. By June of 1974, Zhou Enlai stopped meeting with foreigners. Deng had now stepped into the beloved premier's shoes and was, for the time being, China's top diplomat, in charge of greeting any foreign dignitaries in town. It was around this time, mid-1974, that Deng Xiaoping started to let the USA know that if they would take that leap of faith and recognize the People's Republic instead of Taiwan as the legitimate government of China, all kinds of potential economic opportunities awaited them. Now, at this time, the head of the U.S. liaison office in China, which served as you know our unofficial embassy there, was none other than George Bush 41, father to uh, George Bush 43. Deng also hung the bait in front of the American academics he met with, promising all kinds of potential university exchange programs. I mean, this was an exciting time because everything we see today, you know, in the new China was just getting ready to start happening. And, you know, like mid-1974. By July 1974, Mao began to tire of the Gang of Four. They had gone overboard in their attacks against Zhou Enlai and had hijacked a campaign to criticize Lin Biao as a vehicle to go after Zhou instead. Finally... Mao had had enough, gave them a stern rebuke, and used the three characters that had defined these four forever. He called them a Bang, a gang of four. By this time, Zhou Enlai is living full-time in the hospital. He's still the premier, but Deng is acting in his stead, handling the myriad of matters of state that normally were carried out by Zhou. This was not good for Jiang Qing. She was an enemy of Deng, going way back. She saw that Zhou Enlai was dying and Deng's power was growing. She saw that Mao was showing great trust in Deng, and it was no secret that Mao's days were numbered. So Jiang Qing began to get a little nervous about how she might fare after Mao was gone and Deng was the man in charge. Already Mao could see the whole cultural revolution thing wasn't really going too well, and it was turning into a variation of the same theme with the great leap forward. Policies of the Cultural Revolution wrecked havoc on the Chinese economy. By August 74, a very decrepit Mao met with regional military commanders and called for stability in the face of the destruction caused by the past eight years of chaos. On October 4th, 1974, Mao promoted Deng to first vice premier. It was clear to all now that Mao had made Deng the heir to Zhou Enlai. This was freaking Jiang Qing out, and it's right about now where the battle lines are starting to be drawn. All along it had been thought, at least amongst the radicals and the Gang of Four, that one of their own, Zhang Chunqiao, would succeed Zhou as premier. But now Deng came along and spoiled everything. This was a real shocker to the Gang of Four. Deng Xiaoping was indeed 
no friend of theirs. So later on in October, Jiang Qing went on the offensive and started attacking Deng publicly, specifically a decision he had had a hand in making to buy a foreign-made transport ship. She really seized on this one thing, and in her usual shrill and irrational way, she pointed at this decision by Deng as the indisputable proof of his love of all things foreign and his disdain for things Chinese. On October 17th, at a meeting attended by both Deng and Jiang Qing, they got into a heated argument where Deng blew his top and stormed out of the room. He had finally had enough of Madame Mao and her endless criticisms and political attacks. When word filtered back to the chairman about this incident, he came down hard on his wife and publicly rebuked her. You have to remember, by this time, it's like another mini battle of red cliffs brewing beneath the surface between the pragmatists led by Deng and the radicals led by Jiang Qing and the Gang of Four and ultimately by Mao himself. No matter what, all the way up to the very end, no way Mao was going to abandon his leftist beliefs. He told Jiang Qing to tone things down, but he didn't dismiss her. In December of 1974, Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, these Two founding brothers of the PRC, they met in Changsha and Hunan and hashed out a succession plan about what to do after both of them passed away. Let's just say that Mao finally appealed to reason, and the blueprint for who would be the next generation of leaders was decided. Wang Hongwen was still first vice chairman and therefore a formidable force to be reckoned with. It was decided that Wang and Deng would be the chairman and premier, respectively. January 1975, Zhou Enlai gives his farewell performance in his work report before the National People's Congress. This was the last time he repaired in public, and when he finished his speech, he received a standing and tearful ovation. So Deng was basically in charge of the government by this time. He wasn't the top guy in the party yet. Mao, although on his last legs, was still around, and as long as he was around, so was Wang Hongwen, who spoke for the Gang of Four. Deng Xiaoping must have thought it was deja vu all over again. Here he was, in charge, but he didn't want to fall into the same trap as right after the Great Leap Forward. If you recall, he was tasked with cleanup operations, and he ended up angering Mao with his unorthodox ways of kick-starting the economy. Now he had to do the same thing again after the economic and social devastation in China caused by the Cultural Revolution. But he had to be careful, because Mao was still around, and if he went too far, like he did last time in the early 60s, he was going to get whacked again. The schools and universities were in bad shape. They served as hotbeds for radical activity instead of temples for learning. This was another gigantic weight Deng had to carry. Not only did he quickly need to set this right, but at the same time start the long-term planning to cultivate a nation of future technocrats. Deng spent much of 1975 reforming the military as well. He was no bureaucrat or politician mucking around with the army. Deng was a respected military man himself, and everyone knew he had paid his dues in the 30s and 40s fighting in the mountains against the Japanese and the nationalists. So he had the street cred to go in and shake up the military and whip it into shape. And remember, back then, China didn't even have a fraction of the money they do these days. So all the things Deng Xiaoping envisioned in the beginning were way too costly and would have to wait until after a period of economic development. Deng had several allies to counteract the political might of the Gang of Four. In Deng's corner were all the military men. Ye Jianying, Nye Rongzhen, Su Yu, and others, all men that went way back with Deng and were still a force to be reckoned with. This period in 1973, 74, 75, this period saw intense maneuvering for power between the pragmatists led by Deng and the radicals led by the gang. Even though Zhang Chunxiao, one of the gang, was head of the political end of the PLA, Deng and his allies controlled the real power in the military. So starting in 1975, China's military began the long, hard road back to where it had once been before the Cultural Revolution laid it to waste and turned it into a propaganda machine rather than a machine of national defense. And although I really wanted to uh, stop today's episode at the death of Chairman Mao, 
I know you're all looking at your watches, wishing this half-hour installment might end already. So let's put a bookmark in it right here, and we'll have to continue on next time. We're still in 1975, and Dung's main job now is the acting premiere for all intents and purposes. And remember, Joe and Lai is less than a year to live, and he's in terrible shape. Uh, Dung has to do what he did last time in 1959-1960 after the Great Leap. He has his mop in his bucket, and he's trying to clean up a mess that has lasted for nine years and permeated every single lymph node and villi of the China government, military and civilian society. 1975, busy year for Deng Xiaoping. So we'll pick up in Part 5... Later in the year, in 1975, things are really hotting up between the left and right. It's all leading up to 1976, one of the most tumultuous years in the 20th century for the PRC. Fireworks and explosions will be going on all year. So hopefully we'll get to that in the next episode of this Deng Xiaoping Overview, a free service from the China. I've been using Ezra Vogel's book as my main source. Uh, I recommend it if you're finding his life interesting up till now. Everything I've introduced up till now from his birth in 1904 until 1975 is covered in 103 pages only. And we're already starting Deng Xiaoping Part 5. The balance 611 pages of Vogel's book cover the last 20 years of Deng's life. So it may be information overload, and I'll have to wade through the vast ocean of info from this time and try and give you the Reader's Digest version. Otherwise, I'll have to change the name of this program to the Deng Xiaoping Podcast. From Claremont in Los Angeles County, California, Laszlo Montgomery signing off for now, but join us next week, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.